We're sick and right, right, fans. We're at Santa Fe Spring Checks. Checks. We've never been here before, but hey, you gotta do something once in your life, right? So you better watch and kick back and enjoy Sick and Right. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about thrash metal. Really quickly, for those of you who may have noticed that my background has changed, this is because we're moving. I'm filming this right now from the spare bedroom at my mother-in-law's house. The regular background will return as soon as we get moved into our new house. But anyway, to get back to the topic at hand, thrash is a genre that's been documented quite a bit over the years, but I think there's still a lot left to say. I'm going to do my best to avoid telling you that same story that's been told a million times before. So what I'm going to try to do here is fill in the gaps and a lot of those other books and documentaries that have covered thrash in the past. And what's most interesting to me about thrash is it's absolutely insane longevity. On paper, the genre died about 30 years ago, at least in terms of its peak relevance in pop culture. But as a lot of you are probably thinking right now, is it really dead? I mean, the Black Album by Metallica is still one of the best selling albums almost every week. The thrash aesthetic is still here and is like kind of a weirdly large part of the mainstream pop culture vocabulary. So what happened? How did thrash become such a foundational part of metal, demand a seat for itself at the larger pop culture table, and then kind of suddenly die off. I will do my best to answer all of these questions in this video. I also wanted to mention that I am now streaming on Twitch twice a week. I also have a Discord now that's up to almost 4,000 members. There's links to both of those in the description. And who knows, maybe the thrash fans would still be at the top of the charts if they had paid a little bit more attention to their skincare routine, which is why I'm very excited to have Tiege Hanley as the sponsor of this video. They've helped me start and maintain my skincare routine by making the whole process uncomplicated. Honestly, I think it's probably the single best skincare system for guys like you and me. I recommend you start with their level one system, which covers all the basics. It's got this daily face wash to help you get all the grime and dirt off your skin. This exfoliating scrub that you use two times a week to get rid of all those nasty dead skin cells. An AM moisturizer with SPF 20 because you should always be protecting your skin against the sun. And this PM moisturizer to help your skin stay hydrated and healthy throughout the night. And maybe the best part about Tiege Hanley is that every box comes with an instruction card that tells you exactly when to use each product, how much to use, and in what order. They really make the process of achieving and maintaining your skin amazingly easy. And in addition to amazing skin, members of Tiege Hanley get tons of other benefits, including 25% off the retail price, the ability to customize your box, you can pause or cancel at any time, and you get free US shipping. And if you're outside the US, they do also offer low cost shipping to most countries. And because Tiege Hanley is sponsoring today's video, they're offering my viewers a great deal. Just click the first link in the description, and not only will you get Tiege Hanley for the best possible price, they'll also give you a free gift with your first box. So click that link and get started for just $25. We're from New York, we hate everybody. We are scumbags. We no never matter. get to say fuck. Like I said earlier, I can't tell you the entire history of Thrash, and I'm not going to try because I wasn't old enough to be there, but I can tell you when I was introduced to Thrash, and that was in the summer of 1990, between 6th and 7th grade. It all started when I saw suicidal tendencies on MTV News. They'd been banned from playing shows in LA for like five years because of all the supposed gang violence at their shows, and MTV was covering their first show back, which ended up being used in the video for War Inside My Head, if you've seen that. Whoa! And I was 11 years old, so I didn't really understand exactly what I was watching. All I know is that it just seemed cool and dangerous and edgy, and I wanted to know more about it. Whatever kind of music Suicidal Tendencies was playing, that is now my new favorite kind of music. So when it was my birthday, a couple days later, I took my birthday money, I bought Lights, Camera, Revolution, and that was it. 30 years later, here I am, still talking about thrash. And I don't really remember exactly how, but somehow or another, I discovered that they were part of this larger genre of music called thrash. 
And depending on who you ask, thrash metal started somewhere around the early 80s with bands who picked up where the so-called new wave of British heavy metal bands left off. They took influence from bands like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and Saxon, but really just took everything that those bands did and turned it up, took everything to the next level of speed, aggression, and heaviness. The thing that immediately stood out to me is that thrash wasn't as corny as a lot of the other metal that I had heard as a kid in the 80s. Remember, this was the peak of hair metal, of Warrant, Poison, Motley Crue, Trickster, all that kind of stuff, all the dudes with giant teased hair and lipstick and spandex. I had also heard stuff like Dio and King Diamond from my friend's older brother and from some of my stepsister's older stoner friends. And that stuff was a little bit cooler to me, but still I thought the falsetto vocals sounded kind of dumb and all the leather outfits and the theatrical stuff and the demons and wizards kind of imagery of traditional heavy metal just felt corny to me. respect to those bands and everybody's into it, but just to me personally, it always just felt a little bit too silly and over the top for me to get into. Especially by 1990 when I was getting into it, which was really kind of the tail end of the thrash scene, they looked a lot more like, you know, relatively normal guys. Definitely a little on the edgy side, but really they were just wearing like shorts, sneakers, and t-shirts. None of the goofy leather outfits and spikes and teased hair that I saw with hair metal or traditional heavy metal. And musically, it was everything that I was expecting Iron Maiden to sound like but didn't super fast and aggressive and with that crunchy choppy sound to the guitars with all the palm muting that to me really defined the thrash metal sound And as I got deeper into thrash over the next few years, I realized that it wasn't so much one big genre as more like a collection of subgenres, each of which kind of had their own spin on thrash. And I can't possibly mention all of that here, but I do want to try to give a shout out to what I thought was the most interesting and important stuff. First of all, obviously, we have to talk about what they called the big four. Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, and Slayer. Personally, I never really liked Metallica or Megadeth. Both of them were a little too old school and kind of cheesy for me compared to the, some of the newer bands that I was into. But objectively speaking, obviously, both of them are great bands. My personal favorite of the big four is definitely Slayer. Although I do have a big soft spot for the Joey Belladonna Anthrax albums, especially State of Euphoria when they went all in on the bright yellow not man motif. And looking back now, what's most interesting to me about the big four is how big Metallica got before they even put out the Black Album. That was obviously their commercial breakthrough that made them into the just absolutely gigantic band that they are now. But they were actually surprisingly big before that. They went to number 29 with Master of Puppets and then to number six with Injustice for All, which kind of made them like the world's biggest underground thrash band in a way. Even though they did almost nothing to market themselves, they somehow managed to get this pretty surprising level of mainstream success. Like they didn't even make a single music video until 1989 when they did one. That was their first real music video. Outside of college radio and stuff like that, they were getting zero radio play and yet they were still hitting the Billboard Top 10 and playing these like massive stadium and arena shows based purely on that organic grassroots following that they had built in the underground. It's actually pretty cool to think about that. And the fact that all these bands are still drawing huge crowds, still selling tons of albums, and still in the headlines of the metal sites pretty much every week. I mean, you go look on Metal Injection and it's still Dave Mustaine and Lars and Slayer, you know, all the same names that you would have read about back in the 80s, 35 years later. I think that says a whole lot about how truly great these bands actually were. And if I had to pick one album as my personal favorite out of the big four, I would go with Seasons in the Abyss by Slayer. And then there was what you might call like the big five through 500, that just absolutely gigantic, massive crop of bands. They were kind of the next level down from the big four. All of those bands that were really competent, solid bands, but for whatever reason, you know, because they didn't have a charismatic front man, or maybe they weren't really able to put together truly great songs, they just kind of never really broke out to that next level. Exodus, Testament, Forbidden, Death Angel, and Sacred Reich would be a few names that come to mind here, but there were literally hundreds of bands in this kind of cohort. And if you're only a casual thrash fan, I'd say you could probably skip most of them. But if you're into this sound, I'd say it is worth digging through all of it because for all the crappy generic thrash that you'll never listen to again, there are some hidden gems to be found. As a few examples, Laz Rocket. Fire in the hole. 
forced entry. And a very, very underrated band featuring the legend Gene Hoglan, Dark Angel. I also have to give a shout out to the amazing German thrash scene, which really didn't get much mainstream attention over here, but in my opinion was probably better than the American scene. The Germans just had this like super precise, relentless, insanely aggressive style of thrash that just kind of put 99% of the American bands to shame. It was way heavier, tighter, and just overall more intense. The big names here would be Sodom, Destruction, and my personal favorites, Creator. And even though they're from Brazil, I would actually put Sepultura in this bucket because what they played was very much like German style thrash. They were kind of like the Brazilian creator maybe, but I would say with better songwriting. I think you could actually make the case that Arise is the single best example of German style thrash ever made. And the next flavor of thrash that I want to talk about is what was called the crossover scene, which referred to the idea that this was the byproduct of hardcore punk and thrash metal kind of crossing over with each other. And it was named after the DRI album Crossover, which was one of the definitive albums in this subgenre. And as someone who liked the vibe and attitude of punk, but the sound of metal, this stuff was exactly what I was looking for. And that might seem obvious now, but the thing to keep in mind is that back then, punk and metal were really two separate worlds that did not see eye to eye at all. For example, I was a little bit too young to ever personally see this, but I remember hearing a lot of stories about how back in the 80s, punks would just beat up metal dudes that would come to shows just for having long hair and being metal dudes. And if a band like the Crow Mags would ever go on tour or open for a metal band, they would get all this shit for it because like, what the fuck, man? Why are you guys playing all these metal shows? Very different world than today where punk and hardcore and metal all coexist pretty peacefully. And I could make a whole video about this stuff. Maybe someday I will, but a few names to check out would be S. MOD, Stormtroopers of Death, which is basically just Anthrax with Billy Milano from MOD on vocals. Their first album, Speak English or Die, is an absolute classic. If you have not listened to this band before, just stop whatever you're doing. Actually, don't do that. Finish watching this video, then stop what you're doing and go listen to Speak English or Die because it is that good. A couple other names to check out would also be Nuclear Assault, The Accused, Evil Dead, Cryptic Slaughter, and a special shout out to one of my personal favorite crossover bands, very underrated band called Excel, kind of from the same scene as Suicidal Tendencies. And speaking of suicidal tendencies, definitely check out my personal favorite suicidal album, Controlled by Hatred. I would say it's their most like pure thrash metal album, which features a bunch of re-recorded versions of Mike Muir's old band, No Mercy, and it just fucking rips. And there was also what I guess you could call like a progressive thrash scene, not a huge one, but it was definitely there and it was cool. All the bands that were taking thrash to the next level in terms of technical ability and experimentation, a lot of them were like adding jazz fusion kind of influences. They would really lay the ground for what Cynic and Atheist would do a couple years later. A couple names to check out here would be Forced Entry from here in Seattle. <laughs> Watchtower featuring Ron Jarzombek, one of the most talented, underrated guitarists in metal. And Believer. Anyway, I could keep going on forever because there were just so, so many subgenres of thrash, so many great bands worth talking about. But for now, I will leave it at that. Which brings us to the next section, the decline of thrash. And you know, the way I think of it is that whenever a genre gets this big and this saturated, it's kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it means that there's a lot of great music coming out. But on the other hand, it also means that in order to find the good stuff, you have to swim through this just shit soup of generic derivative crappy bands that just get in the way of finding the good stuff. 
and by the time the 90s came around, I would say that that was absolutely the case for Thrash. This review from ClassicThrash.com, which by the way is a fantastic site if you really wanna dig deep into Thrash, highly recommend it. This review really kinda of lays out how things were by 1992, which is when this album they're talking about came out. Just by seeing the cover and not hearing a single note beforehand, you could already be dead certain that the music is going to be straight out thrash metal and maybe not too original for such. Affliction's sound is laudably heavy and technically there's no reason to complain, but with such a generic offering, it was clearly too little and too late. And that's really just kind of how it was. There were just so, so many bands coming out like every week and he just kind of couldn't really care. I mean, there was nothing wrong with most of these bands, but on the other hand, there's really nothing particularly interesting about them either. And I think that metal fans were just kind of looking for something new and that thrash really just kind of ran out of steam because of this massive oversaturated glut of generic bands. And if I had to point to just one single thing that killed thrash, like that comet that came down and blew up all the dinosaurs or whatever happened to them, I don't even know. Last time I tried to make some sort of analogy about that in my new metal video, everybody got mad and said that I got it all wrong, so probably shouldn't do it, but whatever. To me, that comet that came from the heavens and destroyed Thrash was Vulgar Display of Power by Pantera, which came out in February of 1992 and completely redefined metal by kicking off the groove metal trend. <laughs> that pretty much became the next big thing. It was like almost overnight, every local band had some Phil Anselmo lookalike dude with like a bald head and a goatee trying to like walk around on stage looking like a badass. That was the new thing. But to be fair, I don't think it was quite as simple as that because there was a lot of other stuff going on as well. For example, the alternative metal scene. I made a whole video about this, so I will keep this part brief. Watch that video if you want more. But under the heading of alternative metal, I would include bands like White Zombie, Rollins Band, Primus and Helmet that were definitely heavy, but also more experimental, and I guess I would say emotionally complex than most thrash was. There was also the regrettable funk metal trend of the early 90s that claimed the lives of a lot of thrash bands, but I'm just gonna skip over that for now. The less said about funk metal, the better, but yeah, it was a thing. And of course, on the heavier side of things, you also had the death metal scene, which was just exploding in the early 90s. All that classic, great earache and Roadrunner stuff, like Entombed, Morbid Angel, Deicide, Obituary, Death, and Cannibal Corpse, which really just kind of made Thrash seem almost just like quaint by comparison. To me, it just kind of felt like Thrash was a product of the 80s, and by 1992, after Nirvana and Grunge blew up and all that stuff, the 80s were over, the 90s were here, and anything from the 80s just kind of felt outdated. A lot of the Thrash bands just broke up. There were other bands like Anthrax that kind of changed their style, tried to adapt with the times, and put out an album that was a little bit more alternative, like they did with Sound of white noise, which I personally don't like, but I know it has its fans. And the ones that stuck around and just kind of kept doing the thrash thing seem sort of awkwardly stuck in the past. Like, oh, you guys are still doing that? Ugh. Now, mind you, the big four were still around and still doing great, doing big numbers and all that, but that was the big four. The rest of the scene was not doing nearly so well, and at least to me, by the end of 1992, it was very clear to me that thrash was done. That is, until it made a surprise return about 10 years later. Which brings us to the next section, the rebirth of Thrash. I may be wrong about this, and if I am, please correct me in the comments, but the way I remember things, there was really one band responsible for the whole Thrash revival of the 2000s, and that band is Municipal Waste. I remember when their EP came out in like around 2001 or something. I heard it and I was like, oh wow, this is weird. Somebody's playing thrash again. How funny. Because at the time it was just such a completely dead, unfashionable style that I never thought it would rear its head again. But obviously Municipal Waste saw something that I didn't because they brought it back. And I have to say, I think they did it really, really well. What I think really made it work to me is it was a little bit tongue in cheek. They were making fun of a lot of the thrash cliches like toxic waste and that airbrush style of cover art that Ed Repka made super popular and did so well. But at the core of it, it was honestly just really fucking great thrash. And people heard it and they were like, you know what? Thrash was fucking cool. I'm ready for it to be back. 
And of course, there were lots of other bands to follow, but Municipal Waste, to me, was the one that proved that thrash could be relevant again and opened the door for that whole wave of neo-thrash bands that came after them, like Havoc, Toxic Holocaust, Warbringer, and of course, most notably, Power Trip who really felt like they were on the verge of breaking through to something bigger before their vocalist Riley sadly died in 2020. Rest in peace. So thrash may not be the biggest thing in the world like it was in 1987, but it definitely did return from the dead and has proven to be one of the most influential subgenres of rock and metal. Which brings us to the next section, the legacy. What is thrash metal's impact and influence? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that thrash is the scene that created the single biggest metal band of all time, one of the biggest rock bands of all time, period, Metallica. So that alone is a pretty big deal that kind of validates the genre, I think. And it's really amazing. You know, I wasn't there at the beginning of Metallica, obviously, but I do remember when they were still doing Injustice for All, when they were a relatively underground band that only like the stoner kids at my school liked. And to see where they've gotten to now is amazing. I mean, they've really entered that tier of truly timeless classic bands like the Rolling Stones and Queen, where normies will go buy one of their shirts at Target because they want a rock shirt or whatever. I'm loving like the metallic writing. I keep seeing so many tops with this metallic writing on it. And every time I'm like, I love that top. And it's like the same thing. Like they're really more than just a band. They're a symbol for the whole genre of metal in general. And I know it rubs some people the wrong way when people that don't really listen to the band wear the shirt. That's a whole other discussion. But to me, the fact that they've become one of those bands like the Rolling Stones says a lot about how huge they are and what kind of a space they occupy in pop culture. And although the rest of the big four maybe aren't as big as Metallica, they are still very relevant, still doing great business, putting out, I think, generally pretty good music. They're still named all the time as influences by newer bands. And to me, that's pretty amazing. I mean, they have stuck around for 40 years playing thrash. And even outside of that, to my ears anyway, the influence of thrash metal is absolutely everywhere in modern rock and metal. To me, thrash is the genre that really perfected the palm mute, those like chunky chugga chugga guitar riffs. which is pretty much the core of all modern metal. Like metal is all about the chug, right? And you really have to give thrash credit for showing everybody just how fucking cool it sounds when you play palm muted chugs on a guitar. And really what are modern metal breakdowns, but just a more down-tuned noise gated version of that. We built around the toxicity and my word in the city. And it's interesting to me to see how Thrash's influence has really just become so ubiquitous now that people don't even really think about it. Like hardcore now, as in hardcore punk, if you say that now, it really refers to a sound that's a lot more similar to metal than it is punk. Like if you listen to modern hardcore bands like Drain, Judiciary, or Misery, all three awesome bands, by the way, you should definitely check them out. You'd be hard pressed to tell them apart from a lot of thrash bands in 1989. And speaking of which, speaking of punk and hardcore, I think thrash is actually responsible for getting a lot of kids into punk and hardcore. As one example of that, me and all my friends, like thrash was the point of entry for really my whole generation to get into hardcore. I remember a lot of kids learning about the Misfits from Metallica's Garage Days EP, where they covered Last Caress by the Misfits. Scott Ian from Anthrax would always talk about Discharge in interviews. And they did that cover of Protest and Survive that in my honest opinion is like a hundred times better than the original. which is pretty cool. But on the other hand, you have to wonder how many crust punks did that create? So maybe it would have been better if Scott Ian never gave Discharge any props. I'm sure a lot of kids also got into the Dead Kennedys from seeing their stickers on Jeff Hanneman's guitar. Slayer also did that whole album called Undisputed Attitude that was all covers of 80s punk and hardcore songs, which again, I'm sure got a lot of people into that stuff. Because remember, these bands were huge. They were selling millions and millions of albums, getting all kinds of MTV airplay and stuff on Headbangers Ball. And 
playing stadiums, so this was a huge platform for people to discover punk. And on an even larger level than that, the thrash aesthetic has just become kind of part of the larger pop culture visual vocabulary. Everyone from Kanye to Balenciaga to Justin Bieber has done some kind of metal style merch, usually in that like thrash kind of aesthetic, or like when H&M did that whole line of merch for fake bands. And I know that this stuff pisses a lot of people off because it feels like these mainstream celebrities invading their culture, I get that. But to me, I think it just kind of shows how appealing this whole look and era was to people even if they weren't part of it. Everybody thinks the Metallica and Slayer logos are cool because guess what? They are fucking cool. Those are great logos. So anyway, all of that is to say that although the thrash bubble most definitely burst in the early 90s and thrash may have met an untimely demise at the hands of Pantera and Nirvana, it is still with us in many ways. And if you listen to really any kind of metal at all, you are feeling the influence of thrash, whether you know it or not. I was studying to be a brain surgeon, <laughs> but I smoked too much pot. So that canceled that one. All right, my friends, that does it for this video on Thrash. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Check me out on Twitch and Discord as well. If you haven't, there's a link to both of those in the comments. And also, as always, I want to thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things here on the channel, and I am sincerely grateful for it. Patrons get access to every one of my podcasts a week early. There's members-only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I do q and A's. I do some giveaways sometimes. There's also a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else you want to get my eyes and ears on. So if any of that sounds cool to you, check that out at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.